It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, before I put my question, I want to welcome our next leader, Marit Stiles. Marit, we're all confident that you'll do great things as the next leader of the Ontario NDP. Congratulations. Continue. Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Minister of Health. This week, the Red Cross was called in to support CHEO due to an unprecedented surge of patients. Bringing in the Red Cross should only be a last resort used for unexpected emergency situations. Why didn't this government proactively support and staff children's hospitals in the summer and early fall when health care workers first sounded the alarm about the crisis in pediatric hospitals? Mr. Health. Thank you, Speaker. You know, I, I'm going to quote the chief nursing executive at CHEO who said, it's been all hands on deck at CHEO this viral season as we have responded to unprecedented volumes due to RSV, flu and COVID. You know, it is not lost on our government that in the last month alone, CHEO has essentially doubled their pediatric ICU unit. It is an incredible amount of work that they've been able to do very quickly. We have now permanently made the investment to ensure that those pediatric beds will stay at CHEO because we know that that hospital in particular, because of its large catchment area, has many, many community hospitals that they are serving. They are doing that with a uh, minimum amount of help from the Red Cross. They are partnering with the Red Cross to return uh, the staff who have been redeployed and working in those pediatric ICU units to make sure that they can Response. go back to doing their important work. Thank you. Supplementary question. Again, to the minister, what should have been part of this government's plan all along was a plan to address the root cause of our health care crisis, that staffing issues. This government can take a tangible action right now to retain health care workers. Will the government commit to not appealing one, Bill 124? The President of the Treasury Board. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. As the member knows, uh, and as the AG has stated, uh, we are reviewing the decision and we intend to appeal it. But we will speak to the investments that we have made into the health care system. Over the past uh, year alone, we've increased base spending in health care by over $5.2 billion. That is the largest year-over-year -year increase in the history of this province. When we look at health human resources across this province. We have put in place the investments to support the hiring of over 14,500 net new nurses. That is unprecedented in the history of this province, and we will continue to make those investments as we have with two new medical schools that we are announcing uh, in this province in, in Brampton and Scarborough, uh, making sure we have uh, new medical uh, doctors in the north through that. Uh, so, Mr. Speaker, the members opposite have voted against each of those measures, have voted against every single increase to health care spending on this side of the House. And with our members opposite, we will continue to make sure we make those investments. Thank you. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, they can say whatever they want. They're failing. We've got a crisis. They didn't prepare for it. And we're seeing the consequences of this government's inaction in our hospitals every day. Yesterday, it was a family in eastern Ontario who struggled to find a hospital that could accept them for labour and delivery. First, they tried their local hospital, but the birthing centre was closed due to staffing shortages. The next hospital they tried didn't have room, so finally they returned to their local hospital. That situation should never have happened. The mom, Kendra, said this afterwards, quote, I'm just afraid that the health care will fail me again, fail my son. What does the minister have to say to parents like Kendra who are scared for the future of our health care system? Minister of Health. 
Thank you, Speaker. What I will say to the people of Ontario is that we are fixing a health care system that was woefully ignored by the previous Liberal government. The, the uh, former Premier, Kathleen Wynne, admitted publicly that she should not have cut those 50 doctor spaces that they did to uh, assist in their, their health care crisis. You know, we are making the investments. Some of them are already, we're seeing additional health human resources in our communities, over 12,000 new uh, health human resources who are working out in our communities, in our hospitals, in our long-term care homes. We're continuing to do that work by increasing residency spots, by increasing access, ensuring that young people who want to choose a career in health care have those options, and in many cases, nurses and PSWs in particular, Response. are getting that opportunity with assistance financially from our government. We'll make the investments, we'll continue to do the work, but frankly, we were left with a system that had been ignored for far too long. Next question, the member for Niagara Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Through you to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. In May of 2021, one month after the Premier promised the people of Ontario, quote, I'm not touching the Greenbelt, a company controlled by Silvio de Gasparis took out a $100 million loan at 21% interest to buy 106 acres of Greenbelt farmland in Vaughan. This was an unusually risky loan for an undevelopable property, but less risky if Mr. de Gasparis had reason to believe the land would soon be made available for development. Did the minister or any other government official discuss proposals to develop these Greenbelt lands with Mr. de Gasparis or any of his associates or lobbyists prior to November 4th, yes or no? And to reply, the government house leader. Mr. Speaker, I think the minister has answered that on a number of occasions, uh, Speaker. But I think uh, again, what it comes down to, time and time again, is that the NDP Order. just refused, with the, with the help of the Liberals, quite frankly, they refused to see the challenges that we have in the province of Ontario, the challenges that we are fixing. Of course, there is a housing crisis in the province of Ontario, ostensibly because of the policies that were brought on by the Liberals, supported by the NDP. Colleagues will remember all of those years that the NDP propped up the Liberals to ensure that the, the dream of home Order. ownership that so many of Order. us have fought for our entire lives, our parents fought for under both the Liberals, Liberals and the NDP. That is a dream that has vanished in the province of Ontario, but because of this Premier, because of this Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing and Conservatives on both sides of the House, you know what? We're bringing that dream back, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. We're making sure that we're putting in place policies that will allow people to prosper in the province of Ontario like generations before us, and we only wish that they would get on board. A supplementary question. Speaker, again to the Minister. According to the Toronto Star, the Narwhal and the Globe and Mail, a company associated with private equity firm Orca Equity purchased Greenbelt farmland at 12045 McCowan Road in Stouffville on September 10, 2021. Two months later, the Minister issued a Minister's zoning order for this address to enable a subdivision, despite the fact that it was surrounded by Greenbelt farmland. Did the minister or any other government official discuss proposals to develop these greenbelt lands with any representative of Orca Equity or their development partners prior to November 4th, yes or no? I'm an oscillator. Again, I think, uh, I think the minister has answered that story. Go ahead. Uh, now, I love that the member brought up Stouffville. Stouffville, my hometown, Mr. Speaker. Of course, it is a vibrant, beautiful community. Those who were in Stouffville on the weekend would have had the benefit of one of the most beautiful Santa Claus parades that we have had in the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. And as the people lined the streets, as the people lined the streets on both sides of Stovall, they shouted encouragement to make sure we continued on. You know what they said, Mr. Speaker? Bring more people to Stouffville, Mr. Speaker. That's what they wanted because they all had what we all fight for, the dream of Order. home ownership. The dream of home ownership. Order. We talked about this just yesterday. Now, Mr. Speaker, I challenge any one of them to get up in their place and say it. Say it with me. Home ownership. Home ownership. It's not a bad word. It's something that generations of Ontarians and Canadians have fought for. You're against it. Order. We want it, and we will fight to make sure that all Ontarians share in that. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. The member for Ottawa South will come to order. The member for Toronto St. Paul's will come to order. The Minister of Energy will come to order. Uh, 
restart the clock. The uh, member for Niagara Centre, final sum. Thank you. You're back to the minister. According to the CBC, the Toronto Star and the Narwhal, a company controlled by the chair of the Yview Group Order. acquired three Greenbelt properties along Highway 48 in Markham in March, October and December of 2021. Flato Development also appears to be involved with the development of these rural properties. The minister also seems to have a curious interest in these particular properties. On November 4th, he added them inside Markham's, Markham's urban boundaries when he amended York Region's official plan. Did the minister or any other government official discuss proposals to develop these lands with any representative or associate of Wyview or Flato prior to November 4th, yes or no? Once again, the government has to I think, uh, I think we've answered that on a number of occasions, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I'm glad, I'm glad again he keeps talking about Stouffville. He keeps talking about Markham and Stouffville. I guess the Member of Parliament must be doing something right in Markham and Stouffville, so I thank you for continuously bringing that up for me. Listen, uh, there are a number of home builders who are working throughout, uh, throughout southern Ontario to bring the dream of home ownership to the people of the province of Ontario. As I said yesterday, when my parents came to this country, there was all of them were living in one home. Uh, all of them were living in one home, and the member for Scarborough Southwest riding uh, on Dentonia Park, just off of the Danforth. Six of them. And you know what they wanted? They wanted a home, the dream of home ownership. One, the oldest left, and then the second oldest left. And within 10 years, each and every one of those brothers and one sister had their own home. It is why they left Italy, to make a better life and for all of the kids that they had after that, Mr. Speaker. And that's all that the people of this Response. province want. They want the opportunity to succeed like their parents before them. The only time we lost that is when the Liberals, propped up by the NDP, took that dream away from the people of the province of Ontario. This Premier has brought that back, and we are on the move again, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Toronto St. Paul's. Madam Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Today we honour the National Day of Remembrance and Action on Violence Against Women, exactly 33 years to the day since 14 women were murdered at the hands of violent misogyny in Montreal. This was not an isolated event. Since 1990, over 980 speaker, likely far more, have been lost to femicide in Ontario alone. This year, the Renfrew County Inquest recommendations were published following a years-long investigation into the violent, hate-fueled hate murder of three women in 2015, Anastasia Kuzik, Natalie Warmerdam, and Carol Culleton. From the government, Speaker, it's been per a lot of crickets. My question is to the Premier. Will the Premier explain to these women's families why the government hasn't yet acted on any of these recommendations? Thank you, Speaker. Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker. First, I want to acknowledge the loss of all the women who have been murdered or killed across this province. There will be an opportunity this afternoon at 3 o'clock for each party, each group, to be able to say several minutes on this topic. And I think it, this is an extremely important topic. And all women deserve safety and security. Here, here. And our government is, is continuously, constantly working to make the lives of women safer and to provide that security. And, and for all Ontarians to live free of violence and fear. And we're working to prevent and address violence against women in all forms. And we've made the investments to back this up. Words alone, as the member across the way has stated, aren't enough. And that's exactly why we're making the investments that are necessary to change this. We've launched programs. Response. We've passed legislation aimed at ending violence. And we will continue to do this important Order. work because it matters to all of us. It should matter to society. It should matter to every Ontarian. And we'll continue here, here. to do this. Order. Supplementary. There's no new funding in the fall economics in the fall economic statement on gender-based violence. Back to the Premier Speaker. Femicide is both a predictable and preventable crime, but this doesn't happen through words. It happens through action. We're seeing a massive uptick, Speaker, in gender-based violence, including intimate partner violence. All while the gap between the need for resources and resources available grows wider and wider each year. The urgency to act is grave. We cannot wait for another massacre like what happened in Montreal or Renfrew or anywhere else for that matter to realize what we should have done. 
My question is to the Premier, the government that has the opportunity to do what's right. Will the Premier finally respond to the Renfrew recommendations with a meaningful plan of action and budget to implement them now? Not thank you. And to respond, the Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's a serious question. And as I've said many times in this House, everyone has a right to feel safe in their own homes and their own communities. The violence is completely unacceptable. Gender-based violence is a crime. But we are moving forward. And I want to speak for just a second about the Ontario Police College, where we are introducing new trainings for recruits. This is something our government takes seriously. Everyone has a right to be safe in their own homes and their own communities. Next question, the member for Scarborough, Rouge Park. Sure. Canada recently hosted its first International Swimming Federation World Cup event in more than 20 years in my riding of Scarborough Rouge Park. We welcome more than 450 athletes from 40 countries as they competed at the Toronto Pan Am Sports Centre. I know I can speak on behalf of our entire province in extending our support, admiration and well wishes for this successful event. However, some of our most talented athletes might not have the opportunity to compete internationally in events uh, like this due to financial constraints. Ontario is a global leader in athletic performance and we must continue supporting our competitors as they represent our province and country. Speaker, can the Minister of Tourism, Sports and Culture please share with the House what assistance our government is offering to help our athletes as they represent us on the world stage. Thank you. Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. I'd like to thank the member for Scarborough Rouge Park and yes, I can. Uh, <laughs> our government is investing more than $6.3 million through Quest for Gold program to support high, perform high performance athletes. This program benefits performance in a high level and provides financial support for training, equipment, facilities, access to top level coaches, those facilities, again, that they can work and train in. And every young person in this province should have the opportunity to compete at a high level, just like they should have an opportunity at some day to buy a home. We want all our kids to have the opportunity to play, whether it's through our Jumpstart program or on a bigger stage with Quest for Gold. It's a privilege to be able to represent Ontario and this country on the national and international stage, and we want those opportunities to be available, Speaker. A supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Minister, for the response. Supporting Ontario's athletes show the world that when it comes to sports, we are among the best places to train, compete, and play. Ontario has long been a leading destination for major sports and entertainment events. I appreciate that we are investing in our local talent and hosting events like the International Swimming Federation World Cup, which draws athletes, families, and fans to our province from across the world. Speaker, can the Minister of Tourism, Culture, and Sport please elaborate what our government is doing to support national and international sports events that take place in Ontario? Minister. Speaker, again, thanks for the great question. Uh, Ontario's sport hosting program brings major summer and winter sporting events to the province, such as the FINA, FINA Swimming World Cup Championships, supported by us to the tune of $300,000. We are providing nearly $900,000 to support 14 national and international sport events in 16 host cities across Ontario this year and next, building legacies in communities and building young people and the communities along with it. These events will contribute to more than $17 million to communities across Ontario that feature more than 4,600 athletes. Applications are now open, so I would encourage Indigenous communities, non-for-profit organizations, municipalities to go ahead and submit proposals by January 9th. Together, we are making Ontario a destination to train, Response. to live, and to host. No one does it better than Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Next, we have the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. 
Crystal Quartz, a drag performer living in Guelph, has seen a spike in violent threats against drag artists. She's being threatened by a hate group who has promised to disrupt her performance and give her audience a show they'll never forget. Crystal is now forced to call the local police and hire private security for her events at restaurants such as Boston Pizza and Kelsey's. Speaker, will this government take on bigots who threaten drag performers and their audiences with hate and threats of violence? The Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is a very serious topic, and it's important that we address hate in all of its forms. We're, we're seeing the rise of hate as it relates to religion, gender, uh, all, all sorts of, of different ways of describing it, Mr. Speaker. It's something this government takes very seriously. It's something that we're investing in to make sure that we have the supports for those who are the victims, and it's something that we're making sure goes to the front of everything that we do to make sure that we have people in safe communities in the kind of communities that they want to live in. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. Words are not enough. Yesterday, Crystal shared her personal reflection with me, and I quote, Kids' eyes light up. I'm this big, pretty princess. Parents tell me that the whole week afterwards, it's all their kids talk about. I go into communities that don't have safe spaces and create them. Crystal's upcoming performance this Sunday is a brunch performance. It has already faced additional and escalating threats. What exactly is the Premier doing to protect Ontario's drag community, their artists, their audience, as well as the businesses that host these events? The Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's important that we have the resources available for anybody who feels vulnerable, uh, whether it be before or after a potential incident, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we have training at every level. We have training for those who operate uh, in, in victim services. We have training for those who are uh, judiciary. Uh, we have training for the police officers as they go through their uh, early stages of, the, of their careers, Mr. Speaker. So resources are available. If people are not feeling comfortable, then they can reach out. And I, I note, uh, as particular, we can chat offline or after question period, if you wish, about the resources that are available, because it is important, Mr. Speaker. We're talking about our, our friends and our families and our children and our parents. We want to make sure that everybody is comfortable in Ontario. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Next question, the member for Durham. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. Nuclear power represents a critical component of our province's energy production capability now and in the future. Ontario is a global leader when it comes to nuclear power and in producing new and innovative energy technology. Now, we've heard our government, Mr. Speaker, and the Minister of Energy tout the potential for small modular nuclear reactors to assist us in generating clean and reliable electricity to power Ontario and our growing economy. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister of Energy please tell us more about what the next steps are in advancing SMR technology here in Ontario? What a thrill it was for me to be in the members' riding, the clean energy capital of Canada and the Durham region, along with the Premier on Friday morning to announce that construction is beginning on Canada's first grid-scale small modular reactor. You know, the member's hair was blowing in the wind, and uh, we were all jealous about that, or at least I was. Uh, but this was an historic moment for our province. Construction underway, a 300-megawatt small modular reactor. Well, what does that mean, Mr. Speaker? A 300-megawatt small modular reactor is enough to power a city the size of London, Mr. Speaker. Wow. Our plan is not to build just one on the site at Darlington, but potentially four. That's 1,200-plus megawatts that will add to our clean, and I emphasize clean, reliable, affordable electricity grid in the province of Ontario. We have an incredible team at OPG that's going to be building that BWRX 300. And, Mr. Speaker, the world is watching what's happening in Canada's clean energy capital. Supplementary. 
Great thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for his answer. Uh, to quote that old song from the 60s, uh, the answer, my friend, is blown in the wind, I guess. But uh, with global businesses looking to expand in jurisdictions with clean and cost-effective electricity, small modular reactors will help us as we compete and attract more game-changing investments here at home. SMRs, Mr. Speaker, have the potential to drive job creation, economic growth, and export opportunities, which will allow Ontario to leverage its highly skilled nuclear industry and workforce. However, members from across the aisle continue to say no and oppose the advancement of new nuclear technology. Mr. Speaker, therefore, can the Minister of Energy provide further details on how our government supports this critical endeavour? Minister of Energy. Speaker, this is a tremendous opportunity for our province, and it's a tremendous opportunity for our country. I don't understand why members opposite would be opposed to this kind of technology, a first of its kind, that is going to allow us to create good jobs in our supply chain here in Ontario. Already 76,000 people work in our nuclear supply chain across the country, almost all of them, about 65,000 of them, right here in Ontario. This is a tremendous export opportunity for Ontario and for Canada, Mr. Speaker. The small modular reactor has as I say, the world is watching, and the world really is watching this project, Mr. Speaker. Countries over in Europe and around the world are looking for energy autonomy, energy security, and this is the flexible uh, form of electricity generation that's clean that the world is looking for. It confounds me, Mr. Speaker, that Mr. members Lawrence. opposite aren't standing and applauding the work that is happening in Canada's clean energy capital with OPG in the Durham region. Stand with us and push for this project to be the success that it's going to be, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Nickel Belt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question for the Minister of Health. Linda Lewitt from Sudbury is an endometrial cancer survivor. She requires annual pap tests by our oncology team. She had her test on October 18. Usually it takes between three and six weeks for the results to come in. But when she called her doctor last week, she was told that it now takes six months for the results to come in. Minister, is six months an acceptable amount of time for cancer patients to wait for a diagnostic test result? Opposite is highlighting exactly why our government is making the commitments and making the investments in the, the health care system. We are hiring and training additional health human resources, whether those are lab technicians, personal support workers, nurses, PSNs, doctors. We're making those investments because we saw that we did not have sufficient capacity. The health care system was ignored for far too long. We're making those investments now. We are seeing some very good work out in the field, in the community. We're, we're seeing the increased numbers of nurses, PSWs, who are working in the system, over 12,000 more than pre-pandemic. So we'll continue to get the job done, and we'll make those investments so that we don't have long wait times for things like diagnostic testing. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, when cancer patients have to wait six months for test results, it often means more intensive, more expensive treatment and increased risk of harm. Ontario Lab Services are now dominated by LifeLab, a private, for-profit company. In my writing, LifeLab offers terrible customer service. They let frail elderly people wait outside in minus 20 weather. They have minimum staffing. They have minimum hours of operation and huge delay for test results. Does the minister agree that privatizations of our lab services made our lab services worse? Mr. Health. You know, I, I have to respectfully ask this, the uh, member opposite if she 
read her first half of her question before she filled out the second. You know, you are talking about how we need to increase capacity. We are doing that as a government. We are ensuring that all partners have the ability to expand and continue to offer services in our community, and we will do that with all of our partners. We are not going to freeze out individuals and organizations that can be part of the solution. Thank you, Speaker. The next question, the member for Don Valley West. Thank you, Speaker. On November 25th, 15 top architectural firms and urban planners wrote an open letter to the Premier, I hope he read it, showing how Bill 23 will not help people achieve the dream of affordable home ownership that this government says it will. The letter says it will inhibit the construction of affordable housing, dismantle regional planning and urban design considerations, undermine environmental protection, and limit public participation in how we build our communities, for example, by reducing the affordable housing requirement in inclusionary zoning from 20 per cent to just 5 per cent. It will reduce fees that cities use to pay for housing inspections. Speaker, none of that sounds good for Ontarians. The Premier's own housing task force did not say we need to swap land in the Greenbelt to get housing built. So my question to the Premier, who is telling him that paving over the Greenbelt is the solution to the housing crisis, and are they the same people who will stand to profit from this decision? And to respond, the Premier. Th thank you, Mr. Speaker. I find it so rich and so ironic hearing from the Liberals that changed the Greenbelt 17 times. You should do your homework. You froze housing. We have 300,000 people coming to Ontario every single year. I see the young people there. I see people up here that are renting. Do you know what their goal is in life? Their goal is to own a home. It's supply and demand, Mr. Speaker. But I can tell you the last people we should be listening to is the previous government that destroyed housing, that was voted against every housing bill that we've had. You destroyed housing. You Order. Premier will please take his seat. Stop the clock. Member for Ottawa South will come to order. The Minister of Energy will come to order. The member for Carleton will come to order. The member for Ottawa South come to order. Start the clock. Supplementary question. Member for Dublin. Thank you, Speaker, and, and thank you to the Premier for that passionate response. We can all agree that we need more homes for Ontarians. However, it appears. Clock. Stop the clock. The member will take her seat. But ask the government members not to interrupt another member who has the floor with loud applause such that I can't hear the member who has the floor. Please restart the clock. The member can continue. Thank you, Speaker. We can all agree that we need more homes for Ontarians. However, it appears that private land developers and at least some members of this Conservative government are the only ones who think paving over farmland in the Greenbelt is the solution. Thousands of people have signed petitions. Thousands in Don Valley West have written to me and other MPPs and joined rallies through one of over 30 respected environmental, social justice, housing and agricultural organizations. Municipalities oppose Bill 23 because it threatens affordable housing, it threatens the environment and makes land speculators richer. My question again to the Premier, why is this government ignoring the advice from ex experts and trying to convince Ontarians that this bill is for the people when in fact people can see that it's all about helping the Premier's friends? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, under the leadership of Premier Ford, uh, we've got a housing plan. Here's what we're fighting for, and the Premier's right. We've got young people both in front of me and behind me in the galleries. A recent uh, report from uh, the charitable organization Generation Squeeze released a 56-page report, and, and this is something that I want everyone to listen to, because this is what we're fighting for. This is the crux of the issue. 
In order for millennials to buy a home in the province, the report says average home prices need to drop by $530,000, wow. more than 60% of the market value last year, for them to afford a mortgage that covers 80% of the value. It takes 22 years of full-time work for the typical young person to save a 20% down payment on an average-priced home, the report reads, which is 17 years longer than they were at the, when they were at our age. Speaker, this is the fight. This is what we're fighting for, here, here. to make sure Response. that young people realize the dream of home ownership under the leadership of Premier Ford. We're going to get it done, Speaker. Here, here. Stop the clock. The next question, start the clock, the member for Thunder Bay, Atacoke. Thank you, Speaker. Farmers in Northern Ontario contribute over $200 million annually to our provincial economy. Unfortunately, the previous Liberal government refused to acknowledge the important potential that Northern agriculture could offer. Across the north, a vast tract of fertile land stretches between the Cochrane District and the Quebec border, known as the Great Clay Belt. This area represents an untapped agricultural and economic opportunity for our farmers in the north and our entire province. Our agri-food sector in the north needs assurance that our government is committed to that growth. Speaker, can the fantastic Minister of Agricultural, Food and Rural Affairs please share with the House what actions our government is taking to support northern agriculture? Thank you very much. Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thank you very much to the member from Thunder Bay, Atacoke. You know, I just last year visited his particular area was and impressed with the agricultural presence that that particular region of Northern Ontario has. And just this past week, I spent time in Timmins with the amazing Minister of Mines. His passion and his commitment to the agri-food sector in Northern Ontario not only is infectious, but it's inspired as well. And through our Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs and the Canadian Agricultural Partnership, we have invested $300,000 in a thoughtful strategy that embraces ideas coming from the city of Timmins and the municipality of Blackwater Matheson, as well as our farming communities as well. And that thoughtful approach is taking a look at how we can further develop our lands in Northern Ontario into production primary production. And it's through leadership like the Commerce Management Group and the Abitibi Institute that we're exploring more opportunities. We met with Frank, who's been milking cows since 1958. Response. We met with Karen at Regenerative Farming, Eric, Urban Farming, and Ed, a 1,600-acre cash cropper in Northern Ontario. There's so much more to talk about, and I can't wait for my supplemental. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for her response. With ongoing geopolitical tensions impacting worldwide food supply, food supply chains, sorry, we must ensure we are harnessing all opportunities for agricultural growth in our province. Northern Ontario represents a significant region that could supply Ontario and the world with abundant agricultural products. In particular, the North's Clay Belt region represents a jurisdiction that could increase farm and food production capabilities for the agribusiness sector, benefiting all Ontario. Speaker, once again, my question is to the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. What further actions is our government taking to help create or cement agriculture as a pillar of the Northern economy? Mr. Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thank you, Speaker. That, that's a really good question because the Minister of Mines very eloquently made a fact known this past week when we were in Timmins. You know, the economy in Northern Ontario actually has a trifecta, mines, forestry, as well as agriculture. And our government, since elected, have invested in 250 northern projects, totaling 4.1 million. And I also want to give a nod and, a, and share my appreciation to the Minister of Northern Development, who has supported over 300 projects worth $55 million of investment in agriculture and food production. We're bridging that community in northern Ontario to new technologies and new innovations that will see more arable land in northern Ontario 
that out, outsizes Manitoba into production. And you know, we, it's working because in talking about potatoes, I learned from OFVGA just yesterday that they're looking to increase potato production and Bonds. seed potato production. We're increasing the number of cars on the Ontario Northland are bringing grains down to southern Ontario. Everywhere, every point in Ontario is going to be proud of the agricultural production. Thank you very much. Thank you. The member for London North Centre. My question is to the Premier. Food bank use has hit a record high under the Ford government. The London Food Bank reports that over 20,000 Londoners can't afford food this year. Will this government listen to Feed Ontario, double social assistance rates, tackle precarious work, build social housing, and finally crack down on price gouging in the grocery aisle? Mr. Finance. Uh, Mr. Speaker, thank you to the member opposite for, for that question. You know, Mr. Speaker, uh, the, no question that uh, many are hurting in this province, in this country, with higher uh, price of uh, groceries, among many other things. And that's why our colleagues in Ottawa, across all party lines, have struck a parliamentary committee to look at price food prices right across the province. And that work is happening now. But you know, now that we're talking about the federal government, you know what they could do? to help with the cost of everything in, in, across Canada, they could lower the carbon tax. This Premier, this government took action back in March to lower gas prices at the pump by reducing the gas tax for fuel and for gas, and then extended it for another year, starting January 1st, to provide relief to the many people in Ontario who are struggling with day-to-day -day costs. Question, Speaker, back to the Premier. Today, food banks across Niagara are hosting a press conference raising red flags. They need help. Month over month, up to 10 per cent of St. Catharines population has used a food bank, while usages has doubled since last year. Why? Low wage jobs, high rent, social assistant rates, all while grocery stores are gouging families. Speaker, will this government provide cost of living help of families so they do not have to keep turning to the food banks and review policies that are contributing to driving more people to food banks? Mr. Finance. Well, Mr. Speaker, thank you again for, for these uh, very important uh, questions about the cost of living uh, and many of the, the prices that uh, people are feeling, not only at the grocery store, but at the pumps and, uh, and rent and the high cost of through interest rates, uh, Mr. Speaker, and that's why we've taken action. That's why we started taking action this spring. That's why we moved to reduce gas taxes. That's why we removed the tolls on the 412, the 418. That's why we rebated the license plate stickers. But we didn't stop there, Mr. Speaker. We increased the minimum wage. Mr. Speaker, we lowered the tax rebate so Ontarians pay some of the lowest income taxes for low-income workers across the country. But we didn't stop there, Mr. Speaker, with the guaranteed annual income supplement for seniors, 200,000 seniors. But we didn't stop there. We have helped people on Ontario disability by increasing it by 5 percent and indexing it to inflation. Why did you vote no every Dave. single time for a measure? I remind the members to make their comments through the chair. The next question, the member for Scarborough Guildwood. Speaker, as we approach the holiday season and the final weeks of the year, it is particularly concerning that the Feed Ontario Hunger, Hunger Report shows skyrocketing food bank use, including a 64% increase in first-time visits. Overall, 587,103 adults and children access a food bank in Ontario between April 1, 2021 and March 31, 2022. That's an increase of 15%. And just this week, Canadian food experts projected food prices will rise 5 to 7 percent in the first half of 2023. So it's clear that things are not go getting easier for families. While the Premier and his government admit that stubborn inflation and a lack of affordable housing is impacting Ontarians, there is inaction in leaving the province's most vulnerable out in the cold, and they are hungry. 
Speaker, my question to the Premier. Question. With the Christmas holiday fast approaching and the price of groceries for a family of four going up by over $1,000, what is the government's plan to address these rising costs? And like so many families in my riding of scarborough gilwood why is it that this government is letting families depend on food banks so heavily? Did you reply? The Premier. Speaker and I know Scarborough very well from top to bottom, from east to west, north to south. Mr. Speaker, I just want to remind the people of this province, as you were one of the ministers and your whole gang there, you lost 300,000 jobs. I spoke to the auto sector with my friend Vic Fideli here, and they chased jobs Order. out of the province. Let me remind everyone, as we stand today, in four years, there's 500,000 more people working today than there was when we took office. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, there's 380,000 jobs available. As we sit right here, you can go anywhere down any street in the province and find gainful employment. As, as the Minister of Finance said, Response. we dropped the gas prices for the supply chain by 10 cents. We need the federal government to drop their 11 cents and put meaningful, meaningful uh, relief to the taxpayers of this province. They refuse to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Please make your comments to the chair. Supplementary question. Chair, and I'm very glad that the Premier mentioned working. The impact of the affordability crisis is widespread, and the fact is that this government underspent on our most vulnerable residents throughout the pandemic. Shamefully, this includes those with disabilities. For many on ODSB and OW, the post-budget income support level is still not enough to cover rent, food, and transportation so that they can have healthy, healthy meals. Last week, I met with residents in my riding of Scarborough Guildwood, and after they reached out to me for help, and what I heard, Speaker, was heartbreaking. Kamala told me that while there was a 5% increase for ODSP, it does not come close to a livable income when she faces soaring inflation and when rates were frozen for so long since 2018. Teresa explained to me that her main source of stress each month is getting groceries because the rate increase doesn't apply to OW recipients. In fact, she told me that she spends hours lining up at the food bank to make ends meet. She pointed out that many OW recipients Question. are people with disabilities trying to access ODSP and forced to live on $733 a month. Speaker, will the government preserve the $100 worker related benefit, and will they provide a similar rate increase for people on OW as they have done for ODSP? Premier. Speaker, on ODSP, I remember under the Liberals, they didn't increase it at all. We've increased it 5 per cent, Mr. Speaker, 5 per cent to help the most vulnerable people in our society. As for transit, Mr. Speaker, the member from Scarborough voted down the Scarborough subway over and over again through our great Minister of Transportation. We're building the largest transit plan in North America, $30 billion. We're bringing transit to the people of Scarborough, Mr. Speaker. We're making sure people that are Ontario Works have an opportunity to go out there and get a great job, to make themselves feel great, and also put money into their pockets. That's what we're doing, Mr. Speaker, as they they just absolutely destroyed the economy. We're growing the economy. We saw gains of 22,000 full-time uh, jobs just last Response. month and again the previous month. We're growing Ontario. We're getting it done for the people here. here Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Next question, the member for Oxford. Yes, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Finance. With rising costs due to global inflation, many people in my riding of Oxford, particularly low-income seniors, are concerned. <coughs> High food prices affect household budgets and can restrict people from being able to purchase the items they need. The impact of rising prices is felt first and hardest by the most vulnerable, including low-income families, workers, and seniors. In those challenging times, the government must provide additional relief for the cost of living and prioritize help for those that need it the most. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister of Finance explain how our government will ensure financial support for seniors and those most in need? Mr. Finance. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the hard-working uh, hard member from Oxford for that uh, question. In fact, uh, wasn't there a good announcement yesterday in, uh, in Ingersoll in the member's uh, riding, creating good jobs, good bigger paychecks? in his writing, so congratulations to your hard work. 
not to mention the Minister of Economic Development and the Premier as well. <laughs> Look, uh, it's a very important question for uh, over 200,000 uh, seniors on fixed incomes. Uh, it's really important that we provide support in this environment where inflation, uh, we haven't seen inflation like this in 40 years, uh, not since I was a, a wee kid. Uh, and what we did to help that many 200,000 people out was to double the, gu guarantee, the, gu the guaranteed annual income supplement, Mr. Speaker, to, to yep, by the Minister of Seniors likes it. Uh, we've increased it from $166 to $1,992 per year this year. Response? This is providing necessary and important relief to the many seniors who helped build this province. The supplementary question. Thanks, uh, thank you, Speaker, and uh, thank you to the Minister for that response. It's reassuring to hear that our government is implementing informed and targeted measures to help support our senior population. That said, the issue of affordability is not exclusive to low-income seniors alone. Across the province, all Ontarians expect to see initiatives that help make life more affordable. Speaker, can the Minister of Finance please tell the House what other ways our government plans to support the people of Ontario during this period of economic uncertainty? Again, the Minister of Finance replies. Thank you again to the member from Oxford for the, uh, another good question, Mr. Speaker. Uh, you know, I was uh, I was at the uh, Seniors uh, Poinsettia Tea event at the Pickering uh, Recreation Centre uh, on uh, on Sunday, actually. Yes, and the minister has been there, and it was great to have people out again. Great to see the many seniors in our community uh, get together. And, and that's why we're helping many, many of the seniors and many people, not just in Durham, but right across the province. We took off the tolls in the 412 and the 418, uh, Mr. Speaker. We expanded the low-income workers' tax credit so there'd be more money in their pockets in this environment. We're proposing, as I mentioned earlier the, in the fall economic statement, to extend the uh, gas and fuel tax cut for next year. And, Mr. Speaker, one I'm extremely proud of, we increased the earning exemption for people on Ontario Disability Support Program from $200 to $1,000 for those who can and want to work so that they can have more money in their pockets, Mr. Speaker. The member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. Two weeks ago, I shared with the government that about a thousand tenants in my riding are facing major rent increases, some as high as 14 percent, all because the Premier made unlimited rent increases legal for new buildings in 2018. I have introduced a bill to extend rent control protections to all tenants in the province. Will the Premier give tenants the stability they need and protect them from rent gouging by passing the Rent Control for All Tenants Act? Right respond, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, the, uh, the fall economic statement in 2018 uh, targeted uh, a rent control piece for one purpose and one purpose only, and that was to incent uh, new purpose-built rental construction in the province. What happened, Speaker? Um, it worked. In, last year, in 2021, we had the highest level of purpose-built rental construction since the early 90s. In, in addition, during the pandemic, the, the, the government did a number of things, working very closely with the Attorney General. We fro froze evictions to ensure that at the height of the pandemic, uh, our most vulnerable were had a safe, secure place to call home. But, Speaker, you know, I, I don't want to couch my words. I make no mistake. The government is not going to go back to the times when there were no purpose-built rental construction in Ontario. We want to build upon the success uh, of that 2018 Response. Uh, amendment to ensure that there is an incentive to build more purpose-built rental. And in the supplementary, I'll talk about other measures that uh, this member and her party voted against. Supplementary, the member for Waterloo. Uh, thank you. Uh, back to the Minister. Last week, residents of Sunnydale Housing Complex in Waterloo were notified of a 5.5 per cent rent increase happening on January 1st. Spicecart, the owner of Sunnydale, received an exemption from the Landlord and Tenant Board to raise tenants' rents 
over 2.5 per cent. Many Sunnydale residents live on fixed incomes. They are vulnerable, and quite, have, uh, quite a few are new refugees uh, to our region. Given the lack of affordable housing options in the region, this is a cruel thing to do. Speaker, why does this government refuse to bring in stronger rent control protections, which would protect tenants of Sunnydale and renter households across the province? Good, Mr. Well, well, Speaker, the member knows I'm, I'm not going to comment on a, on a case that was before the, uh, the Landlord and Tenant Board. It's a tribunal and it's impartial, and there's no role for me to, uh, to respond for that. But what, what I will say, Speaker, is over and over again, every time this government places uh, you know, a policy on the table, whether it be through regulation or legislation, uh, that member and New Democrats vote against it, whether it be the 2018 uh, initiative that resulted in a record amount Order. of purpose-built rental being uh, constructed, whether it be Bill 184, the Protecting Tenants and Strengthening Community Housing Act, they voted against it, and even in Bill 23, the Building Homes, More Homes Built Faster, the, the, one of the best incentives is that D.C. exemption for family-sized uh, rental accommodation, 25 per cent. Again, Speaker. Every time the government puts forward an incentive Response. to build more rental accommodation, that member and the NDP vote against it every single solitary time. Next question, the member for Richmond Hill. Hey. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Under the previous Liberal government, Ontario's emergency management system was not up to date. Oh my goodness. Stockpiles of personal protective equipment were depleted or expired when they were critically needed. Mm -hmm. The province was left with the serious challenge of finding the new PPE when worldwide production shortages occurred. My this was unacceptable. My constituents in Richmond Hill were very concerned. Our government must ensure that Ontario is never again placed in a situation where critical supplies of personal protective equipment must be sourced from other jurisdictions. Speaker, can the Minister of Public and Business Services Delivery please update the House on what action our government has taken to safeguard our access to critical PPE supplies. Thanks, Daisy. Excellent question. Look and business services delivered. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. I, and I thank the great member of Richmond Hill for her question and the great work she is doing in, in her community. Speaker, under the leadership of Premier Ford, this government remains laser focused when it comes to the health and safety of Ontarians. And this is why we have built a robust PPE stockpile to protect frontline and other critical workers while ensuring our province is ready for any future emergencies. Speaker, we have shipped over 700 million pieces of PPE since the start of the pandemic and approximately, we have actually procured and distributed over 157 million of rapid antigen tests, 97,000, over 97,000 HEPA filter units, and thanks to Premier and this great Minister of Economic Bonds. Development, Job Creation and Trade, I'm proud to say that 93% of the forecast PPE procurement for the next 18 months will be with Ontario or Canadian-based manufacturers. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I am relieved. Thank you, Minister, for all the actions that you have taken for us. As we move forward, it is encouraging to know that our government's actions, which will be providing Ontario with a dependable supply of personal protective equipment. While our PPE stockpile remains a critical part of our government's plan to stay open, mm -hmm. we know that the whole of the government approach will be required to address any future needs that could arise. Speaker, can the Minister of Public and Business Services Delivery please elaborate on how the government is strengthening our emergency response planning? Minister. 
Thank you, Speaker, and I thank the member for her supplementary question. Speaker, under the leadership of Premier Ford, we learned that it is important to keep our stockpile of PPE and critical supplies stable so we are able to respond to surges associated with extraordinary events while balancing the changing needs within the sector. While my ministry has typically overseen our province's pandemic supply chain procurement, we continue to provide the necessary support to the ministries, for example, Ministry of Education, colleges and universities, okay. health, long-term care, and other ministries to support them in the great job they are doing to keep our students and vulnerable Ontarians safe and feeling protected. Speaker, our government will continue its data-driven approach, ensuring we Response. avoid the mistakes made by the previous governments and are well prepared in the future. All of this will further help us to ensure our province stays open and continues to thrive. Thank you. Next question, a member for Algoma, Manitoulin. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. The Auditor General revealed last week that $158 million was diverted from highway improvements on Highway 17 and 11 in Northern Ontario. I want to know why. <laughs> to apply the Minister of Transportation. Well, the Ministry of Transportation was very clear that the projects that were identified in the Auditor General's report as deferred have actually all moved forward, either in the planning stages or due diligence stages or the construction stages. But the, minister, the member opposite knows very well that our government has been, has been committed to road safety and construction in Northern Ontario. We're moving forward the twinning of Highway, 7, Highway, 11, Highway 17 between the Manitoba border and Kenora. We have been working on building 14 new rest stops and rehabilitating 10 rest stops to make sure that we can provide safety for our drivers as they're going along our northern roads. And we're moving forward with an innovative new highway pilot called the Two Plus One Project, a project that came from the, uh, from the Northern Transportation Task Force and was recommended by people who live and drive in the north and who take road safety there so seriously. Response. We are very proud of the record that we have on keeping our northern roads safe and on rehabilitating and building our highways there, and we're going to continue to do that. Supplementary question. Speaker, shortchanging the North has some serious outcomes, and unfortunately, what we see in the media in the North is another fatality, another family that has lost a loved one. And this is something that the member, my, myself as the member for Amalgoma Manitoulin, I don't want to get used to seeing in our papers. I want to see improvements to our highways. I want to see this investment of $158 million return to those highways in Northern Ontario. I want to see safe roads. I want to see the member's bill from uh, to, James Bay to uh, uh, Meshkegawa, actually supported by this government, to bringing the highway services down to eight-hour standard, to making our roads safer on, on our highways in Northern Ontario. That's what I want to see on our highways. I'm asking this government, are you prepared to making the investments that were initiated for Northern Ontario return so that we could have safe highways as everybody else deserves in this province? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, the member opposite knows that we are investing over $600 million in our highways in the, in our, in the north, and as I just mentioned, that all the projects identified in the Auditor General's report as deferred are actually all moving forward. Our government is committed to building in the north, and we're committed to road safety in the north. That's why we brought forward an, a completely new standard, standard for highway winter maintenance, a 12-hour to bare pavement standard. The, the, best and highest standard anywhere in Canada. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we have made significant investments in equipment. We're bringing innovative new solutions to keeping our roads safe, and we're going to continue to work to work to find the best standards and to do the best we can by the people in the north. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning. Point of order, the member for Barry